Steve, and we're going to be talking about Judgment, the Second Death, Part 2. Last time we got together, we looked at the issue of some very serious issues of life and death, and also judgment on the after side of death. According to Scripture, a man is appointed once to die, but after this, the judgment. So in these two sessions, we're going to deal with the issue of God's justice, how he makes the determinations for, for exoneration or for guilt. And we're going to go through two different types of judgments. One, the judgment of the just, and one, the judgment of the unjust. In this particular session, we're going to go into the deep pits of hell, if you will, uh, to see if there's any justice in eternal conscious torment. So now let's take a look at the issue of judgment for the just and the unjust and see how that all comes together in the Bible. May God bless you. In this second segment, I'm going to put a microscope on this fallacy of what is commonly known as hell. There's been an unfortunate number of people all over YouTube who have been down to hell and now they're back to give a stark warning from the land down under. I will say right up front, a few have written books about their trips to hell and there's something very different about their stories lining up with the Bible's descriptions of how justice is actually implemented and when, in fact, the wicked get the reward. According to all the testimonies I have read or viewed, hell is full of angry, hissing, teeth gnashing reprobates, and as you will discover, an alternate world where there are some pretty bizarre things going on down there. In just a moment, we will hear the eyewitness account of such a scenario. Will Jesus, who is a righteous judge, send anyone to the determined punishment before their case is heard? Shouldn't guilt be determined first? And then ask, what is the acceptable kind of punishment Yahweh has allowed? And ponder this, if these folks are already in hell, why will they be needed for a future judgment? Does someone have an honest, rational, biblical answer to this? So what is the truth here? Are people really in hell right now? Let's start here by sharing the testimony of a woman who actually went down to hell and came back to tell us some very odd stories. In her book, A Divine Revelation of Hell, we read in somewhat graphic detail what she had to say about the living dead. Oh, uh, they are dead, but actually living down yonder. Uh, here is what she saw as Jesus gave her a guided trip down to the different parts of hell. We're going to talk about uh, witchcraft here a minute, and what I know is only what the Lord has shown me and told me. We were walking around the jail cells that were 17 miles high, and there was a, to my surprise, there was a rocking chair inside this jail cell. And there was a skeleton sitting in here with an old little ragged doll, rocking back and forth, screaming and crying. And Jesus said, she's in great torture and great pain. I said, oh my Lord. And so he took me over and he would elevate me up in the air, guys, and there was this coffin. It was open at the top. It was old wooden coffin, old timey coffin. And there was a skeleton on his back with real blood on his hands. And you were talking about the demons. They were 12 of them marching around the coffin with little slaps with spears. Because people in hell feel like they have a real body. They feel like that they're, they're in their own flesh. And he was stabbing this coffin in, in there with the, the man inside and he would scream and torment. And they do that 24 hours a day all the time. What happened, she, this corpse was standing there and they would each one would come and pull an arm off, pull the head off, the legs off, and, and the tarsal they had. So they would take that body where they pulled it apart and they would scream. Every piece of that body would scream for the other part. And they would take it all over hell and bury it, laughing. Now these in hell I seem like animal creatures, okay? It may have been an illusion, okay? Because they are illusions in hell. The devil brings illusions, a false paradise and everything. But I've seen these with corpses on the backs of them also, and burning and screaming. Even the horses was on fire. Murray Baxter speaks of an illusion and I looked it up. It's, it's a thing that is or is likely to be wrongly perceived or interpreted by the senses. Or in my estimation, this could possibly fit into the delusion category. Either way, whichever way we see it from, this dear lady is miles away from what the Bible says about the specifics of the judgment. 
The details of her experience are contrary to what is clearly revealed in the Bible. We're warned to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. So, let me ask you, does hell, does it add up to the analysis? Does it hold up? According to Mary Baxter, the bad folks go to punishment immediately at death, but come on, really, will the righteous judge send anyone to their determined punishment before their case is heard and the accused found guilty? Never. They will have their day in court first. Count on it. And does the Christian message convey the right thing to the scoffers of our society? The Freedom From Religion Foundation strives to pick on the obvious flaws of twisted theology. And I don't know about you, but I believe our perception about this so-called hell stuff is misguided and it is twisted portrayal of divine justice. Let's be honest here. The way we communicate how the Almighty will judge the wicked is on a level of bizarre. In this picture, some are common perceptions of church folk. These signs are setting out along the roads and the open for all to see as they go by them. What kind of message does this church reflect to a scoffing world about a loving Savior with messages like these for kingdom's sake? Visualize going down the road and seeing there is no party in hell, it's just one big barbecue. Oh, and by the way, if you're a vegetarian or a musician, you're going to hell, according to one of these signs. And for the ministry director who put that message up there, let me give you a word. You're doing an excellent job working for the enemy of souls. And you better listen very carefully to this message. This distasteful, appalling doctrine pertains to Jehovah as a sadist. And the only one that does have a just balance and skills is him. But this hell teaching is most disapportioned and has produced more unbelievers than converts. The highly regarded C.S. Lewis collaborates that the doctrine of hell is one of the chief grounds on which Christianity's attack is barbarous and the goodness of God impugned. Yes, a harsh appropriation demands a harsh response for most folks. It's the goodness of God that turns the head of the seeker. The other is counterproductive. We desperately need to be straightened out on this matter. It's a big matter of life and death. How about this sick, twisted, hyper-sensationalistic remark found in a children's book, and it says this, Little child, if you go to hell, there will be a devil at your side to strike you, and he will go on striking you every minute, forever and ever, without stopping. Let me ask you an important question. Where does one find the love of God for Yeshua's sake in such nonsense? Two plus two comes out uneven here. There's something out of place. Now let's examine another witness to an up close and personal encounter who had one in hell. Here this man says that he was not out of body or in body. Well, let's check. Is he speaking the truth? Then I, in the, in the middle of this, I'm put into a tomb. The Lord tells me, son, if you continue to believe what you believe and preach it, this is going to be your punishment. And I'm put into this tomb. And in this tomb, I see like, uh, like a spider. I see like a monkey. And I, and, I, and I see a spider, a monkey, and I see a rat. And I'm in this tomb and I can hear billions of voices. But I can ascertain and understand them. Now, your frontal cortex, where you make your decisions and your cognitive facilities, right? That's where it all happens. It can't process that. Your ears can't assimilate and process all of that. But when you're out of your body, you can. Sir, you're absolutely right. I can't process what you've just said about your experience in hell, especially the part where you're in the tomb with a spider, a monkey, and a rat, closed up nice and comfy in a tomb together. Am I impressed with such a testimony as this? Not at all. But how about billions of voices cursing you, jeering you, making fun of you, tormenting you, lying to you, messing with your mind, millions of them, hearing each one of them, understanding each one of them. Each one of those, boom, shoots in there, boom, hits you. You've done the deed, you're there. You lied, you preached a false gospel. You told people they were eternally secure, though you knew as a person who studied Greek and Hebrew, it wasn't feasible. Here's my concern. A guy like this who teaches and promotes eternal conscious torment 
It does not line up with the character and personality of love itself, nor does it square with the Bible either. If we purport to speak for God, we need to be careful and try to be accurate in what we represent God as saying. I believe the traditional view of hell is a horrible scandal against the nature of God in himself. I want you to see what some of the most influential and scholarly are teaching concerning this doctrine of eternal conscious torment. And what I find interesting here is there's a wide array of opinions as what the hell is and what it is not among them. One of the greatest untarnished soul winners of the 21st century did not believe that hellfire was literal where fires torture people for trillions and trillions of years. Here's how Mr. Graham put it. He says this, I think that hell essentially is separation from God forever, and that is the worst hell I can think of. But I think people have a hard time believing God is allowed to allow people to burn in literal fire forever. He concludes, I think the fire that mentioned in the Bible is a burning thirst for God that can never be quenched. And when it comes to literal fire, I don't preach it because I'm not sure about it. Well. That's safe enough, or is it? Mr. Graham doesn't believe that the fire that consumes is an actual literal fire. Add to this, one of the most renowned theologians ever to live, John Stott. Stott was an English Anglican priest who was noted as a leader of a worldwide evangelical movement. He was one of the principal authors of the Lausanne Covenant in 1974. In 2005, Time Magazine ranks Stott as one of the most hundred influential people in the world. And here's what Stock confided. Emotionally, I find the concept of eternal conscious torment intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. And then Mr. Stock made this bold declaration. The ultimate annihilation of the wicked should be at least be accepted as legitimate and biblically founded alternative to their eternal conscious torment. Yes, there is a legitimate biblical base. Bishop, award-winning author and professor, Bible scholar and passionate follower of Jesus are among the many titles that can describe N.T. Wright. Newsweek has referred to him as the world's leading New Testament scholar. With over 50 books to his credit, Mr. Wright sends it up pretty clear as he concluded, since humans are not by nature immortal, only those who are saved are granted immortality so that all others are simply extinguished. Don't miss this. Nowhere will you find bad folks granted eternal life. Quite the opposite. The wages of sin are death. As devoted believers in Yeshua, we understand that eternal life only comes through Yeshua and for Him. If you have a son, you have life. Without the son, there is no life at all. End of story. How about this very influential figure of Christian history? His name, John Calvin, the author of Calvinism. He says, We may conclude from many passages of Scripture that it, eternal fire, is a metaphorical expression. In other words, Calvin says, The fire is not real. It's not literal. But a metaphor to express abstract intent. The point is, for those who don't believe in a literal judgment by fire, they, of course, understand the fallacy of eternal torture in a different light altogether. Even Charles Hodge, who was a Princeton scholar and the father of American Calvinism, Mr. Hodge declared, There seems no more reason for supposing that the fire spoken of in Scripture is to be a literal fire than that the worm that never dies is a literally a worm. Well, you know, you can sure tell that these guys no more believe in eternal conscious torture than in the tooth fairy. Oh, and just a side note on what I think here, this is for the record. Yep, there's going to be a literal fire, all right, and yes, a lot of food for real maggots over smoldering corpses. And the fire will be so hot that, well, here's how the prophet describes it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Jehovah will put an end to sin and to the evil behind it. Count on it. 
The phrase burned up sounds pretty final to me. Oh, before we move off the anti-eternal torture scholars, here's one more theologian of worldwide notoriety who openly opposes the conscious eternal torture fallacy. F.F. F. Bruce was Ryland's professor of biblical criticism and exegesis at the University of Manchester in England. During his distinguished career, he wrote more than 40 best-selling commentaries and books. He also served as general editor of the New International Commentary on the New Testament. If you have ears to hear, hear this. F.F. F. Bruce really nailed it when he concluded, we need to survey the biblical material afresh and to open our minds and not just our hearts to the possibility that the scripture points in the direction of annihilationism. And that eternal to conscious torment is a tradition which has to yield to the supreme authority of scripture. Well, Mr. Bruce, God bless you. I'm taking your advice. After hearing from the witness of these numerous noted and decorated scholars, those who have studied way beyond most, what about us? I know many of us have questions that need rational answers about this hot topic. You know, there's a, here's a reasonable question that demands a valid response. Does God punish people for thousands of years with infinite, eternal torment for things they did in a few finite years of life? How would you answer this? My mother struggled with a bad illness when she turned 50, and in the last three years of her life, she was in pretty bad pain. There was real anguish and heartbreaking to watch her in so much pain. She was 53, cancer was in her brain, lungs, liver, it was ugly. She died before her time. If some of that horrendous struggle weren't enough, now she's down in some dungeon being tortured by all kinds of oddball creatures forever? I think not. But according to one hell expert, the answer is yes. And here is a best-selling author, best known for his book, 23 Minutes in Hell, Bill Weiss. Let's hear what he had to say about his trip to hell and what a freaky place this is. And I found myself falling through the air, down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter. And then I landed on a stone floor in an actual prison cell in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell, but like a dungeon. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell, these demons, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long, and they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal, and they had the most ferocious demeanor about them. They had an extreme hatred for God. They were blaspheming and cursing God, and then they had this hatred they directed towards me. The one picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. I hit the wall. I felt like bones had broken. Even though a spirit doesn't have bones, it felt that way. I collapsed on the floor, and I wondered how could I be alive through this? The other demon picked me up, dug his claws in my chest, and just tore the flesh open. I couldn't believe I was surviving this. How could I be alive through this? While I was taken out of this prison cell, I was placed over next to this large, raging pit of fire that was actually about a mile across with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And this is where I could first see people. There were thousands of people inside this pit screaming and burning. It was so horrendous to see a person on fire. They just looked like skeletons. I wanted to talk to a person, but you're kept isolated and alone for all eternity. You never ever get to be with people. For all eternity, you're kept by yourself. You know, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. And I just missed her so much, I wanted to be with her so much. With a testimony of this sort, we need to be diligent to test what he is propagating here by the Bible. Do we even find any evidence of demons slicing and dicing bad folks in the Bible? I haven't found any evidence yet, and I have been looking for a long time. According to the Bible, reward does not come until the judgment. Well, let's consider this primary preface first. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. For believers, they will be judged by their Savior, with whom they have trusted, having an advocate and judge on our side when in court is a win-win situation. But if there is no one to stand up to plea our case in that day, then we should anticipate a certain fiery judgment headed our way. Regardless, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Yeshua, so that each of us may receive what is due us 
for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Yes, as in any courtroom, the judge will need to get all of the evidence in before a decision can be made as to the guilt and then exact the punishment. Thus, for the believer who is trusted in the special counsel provided for them, a court-appointed advocate, if you will, has already won our case. But there are a few formalities that must happen first. The Bible is clear as to when this judgment commences, and as the ruling is made in favor of the saints and exoneration is pronounced, then they will receive the reward which is due. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Savior comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. For the Son of Man will come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will repay each one according to what He has done. Again, a revelation that judgment is determined before Yeshua returns in power and great glory. As things wrap up for putting away evil for good, the Savior goes out and rescues the godly from trials and holds the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. According to this clear revelation, everything is held up until the day of judgment. The wicked will be judged, sentenced, and then the punishment phrase will be commenced. That's how it goes. Friends, there is no one in hell suffering torture at this point, period. By his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment, and the destruction of ungodly men. Again, the day of judgment is reserved. It's a day set apart to destroy the ungodly by fire. Destruction will not take place until after the judgment, not before. No judge will execute the death penalty before the accused is brought before him and after then, the case has been heard and formal sentencing has been determined upon the guilty. Only then will the execution be carried out. Yeshua declared, the hour is coming which all that are in their graves will hear his voice and come out to get what is coming to them. Until judgment day, man awaits judgment in his jail cell, the grave. Until then, dust we came from, dust we return. So at the present moment, the offender is waiting for his day in court. The bad guy is being held and has a resurrection day set with the judge. For the condemned, the death will come twice. It's called the second death. But wait, here's another witness who's been to hell who has a different story. And they contradict the biblical account of when judgment takes place. According to this eyewitness, it's here, it's now. And I remember, not remember, but what I seen in my spirit when I was out of my body. There was five demons that ran around me. And they were covered in black, almost like witches and warlocks covered themselves. Some of them were different. Some of them have face of like rats. Some look like bats. As I'm going forward, something caught my attention. My arms were straight out. And another thing that caught my attention was that I wasn't walking. I was gliding. And as I'm gliding, I had these chains on me. Chain with the ball on the end. They were so heavy, I wanted to put my hands down, but I just couldn't. I was taking that pain. And I remember seeing these demons, and I kept saying, where, where am I? Let me go. They wouldn't say nothing to me, but they'll look at me, and they'll laugh. They were giggling. <laughs> That's all they were there. And I can see them. They had real long, long fingernails, real powerful, sharp nails, like razors. But they wouldn't respond to me. They were just giggling at me, laughing at me. So as I'm moving forward, I start seeing this big, big black tunnel. This tunnel was huge, and I can hear the sound of this tunnel. So I'm just standing there, okay? And then suddenly these flames just rose from the ground up real hard. That's the sound that I heard. Demons torture you in different way. 
even sexually. They can tear your head. They can sexually attack you. They can cut you. They can stab you. They will tear your pieces and you're still alive. You can feel everything that's going on. I go forward. I'm not saying this to scare you guys. I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm just telling you this is the true what happens after death. One day, even though it's been a long time coming, the judge will then execute the sentence. Payday will come. The timing is very clear. It begins with this. The prophets had a vision about the judgment. Prior to the bridegroom's return, preparations are made, and as certain events prophesied happen on the earth, it triggers something in the throne room which initiates the final work in heaven. This is how the prophet Daniel explains it. <clears throat> there before me was another horn, a little horn, the horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as he's speaking, the scene shifts upward in this account. The prophet records, as I looked, thrones were set in place. The ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was like flaming fire. Its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Daniel then adds, In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And there was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall, shall never be destroyed. This heavenly ceremony is full of jubilance, as the Son of Man now is awarded his kingdom to come, and a pronouncement to go get his bride, who has been eagerly waiting for his return. The Father judges no one, but has assigned all judgment to the Son. Now. He has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Yes, friends, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, who pleads for those who are his. As a great heavenly high priest comes to the Ancient of Days to claim his own, in the judgment seat is Yeshua, and before the Savior intervenes to gather up his faithful, the spotless Lamb of Jehovah stretches out his blood-stained hands over the mercy seat. Our response? were commanded to repent and turn for, to the one who has died for you, so that your sins may be wiped out when the times of refreshing may come from Yeshua. Please understand, to be pardoned, we can no longer go our own way, but go his way in a relationship with the only one who can defend us against the death penalty we all are facing. The same judgment scene is written down by John, and he was taken in vision to the throne room. Again, the Lamb of El Shaddai is seen coming to the Father to receive honor due to him. The Revelator records what he saw with some additional insight. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creature and the elders. This is the same number, by the way, of angels that Daniel spoke of 2,500 years ago, as we have just seen. Worthy is a Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches and, and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Only one who could offer atonement and only one who can now bargain and begin the real work of cleansing evil from Jehovah's created order. As a promise from the Heavenly Father is finalized, he then hands Yeshua a scroll with seven seals, signed, sealed, and delivered. The prophet declares, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. All shouting, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. As the Son of Jehovah unfastens the seals, judgments are loose on the earth, and the countdown begins. It's time to eliminate the problem of evil and to come get his precious possession to that which he paid for with his own blood. The Almighty describes through the prophet Isaiah what was in the mind of Elohim as the judgment day of vengeance arrives. 
For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation to me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength. Yes, judgment begins to fall. It's time to gather up what he calls my redeemed. Don't miss that. He's coming back because of us. He's not slack with his promises. He's been patient with us, not willing that any should perish. He can and he will take care of business in time to finish what has been started when Lucifer chose another path. He had gathered up many followers. The case has been decided. The battle ends. Time to seal the deal by putting out of existence any trace of evil. With righteousness he will judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Release and reward to the poor and meek. But look, a terror-filled reckoning to those who were lawless. Time is up for the wicked. This is a day of vengeance and it's harvest time, and the terrors are gathered up first as the wheat goes into the barn. Jeremiah saw this day and proclaimed, the harvest has passed, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. You know, it's right here. I'd like to point out, as we read or interpret, we need to apply the truth of Scripture and be careful not to overlook the artistic dimension, or we will miss an important part of enjoying the Bible and understanding the fullness of what is being said here. The Old Testament is full of similes and metaphors to provide a clear word picture of something relatable. What is that? Over and over, we find the illustrative writer conveying a reality in this matter. As smoke is blown away, you will drive them out. As wax melts before the fire, the wicked will perish in the presence of Yeshua. The metaphor of blowing smoke and wax melting provide a good example here. And we find a triple crown on this revelation summing up the matter in this way. The wicked will perish. You know, we might want to do a serious study on what perish means. That's finished business, in my understanding. The first and the last announces, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their inequity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. No longer, friends, can the created ones mock their creator. Reckoning has arrived. The fire that consumes will come because Yahweh is a consuming fire that the prophet Isaiah saw this day and describes the coming Messiah as coming in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and his sword the Lord will execute on all people judgment and many will be in that day slain by Jehovah. Oh, have you ever heard this scripture quoted anywhere? As he comes to pay back the author evil and his followers, the prophet singles out some very eye-opening revelations about part of the who that will come to a fiery end. Let's look. Those who sanctify and purify themselves and go into the gardens, falling one in the midst, eating pig's flesh, and the abomination and the mice, shall come to an end together, declares Jehovah. You know, the fire of Jehovah will make an end to these folks who have willfully chosen to disobey him, regardless of how screwball it sounded when he told you to obey him. According to this, all of it will come to an abrupt end. I've never seen anyone highlight this surprising judgment. Have you? If you have ears to hear, do so. Chew on this one for a while. The case is closed. Everything has been determined. Thus the proclamation, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Too late to do something different now. What you are now, you will remain. The point of no return arrives suddenly. If Yeshua came today, will he find us in the path of the just or the unjust? One thing is for sure here. God is just and payback arrives. 
And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who do not know God and disregard the gospel of our Lord Yeshua. We have just examined some Old Testament imagery confirming a fiery end for many. It is critical to remove our preconceived notions about how this hell thing will really come down. Let's ask ourselves, what does the text really say? This one tells us there's a payday and a payback coming. To those who had closed their ears to the truth, the gospel was regarded as just another myth. The story of Jesus and the cross he died on was ridiculed. Tragically, they chose other cheap imitations. Those who had rejected and mocked creationism now are recognized as weeds thrown in a flaming fire to be burned up in the trash heap of Gehenna. The weed gets what it sows, choked out for good. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Choose not to know, choose not to obey, and here's your lot. Bottom line, you get to choose. These are the ones who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the presence and the glory of his power. Please take note, the punishment is destruction, no escaping this, and that which was destroyed will be forever destroyed, gone forever, never to return again. That's the true definition of what everlasting destruction is. Please notice that this does not say everlasting destroying. Destroying is continual. Destruction is a completed act. A good etymologist knows there's a big difference between the two. The wicked are punished, shut out, shut away, shut off for good. In the book of Revelation, this is found when the seventh trumpet, also known as the last trumpet sounds, earth time stops and kingdom time commences. Payback is fierce and judgment comes down hard. The prophets receive a glimpse of a devastated earth. Time to judge, time to reward, time to destroy. Let's move again into the judgment scene with the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God, who fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We gave thanks to you, O Jehovah, God Almighty, the one who is and who was. You have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations were enraged, and your wrath has come. The time has come to judge the dead and to reward your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. As the reward of immortality comes to the faithful, destruction follows. According to the prophet Isaiah, the earth is destroyed. Because of the devastating result of rebellion, judgment falls on an unrepentant earth. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgress laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. As it was in Noah's day, this wayward planet had become another habitation for those in whom was found only evil was in their hearts continually. No hope left, just devastation. The flood account adds this. Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and a fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. This polluted earth will be destroyed one final time, next time by fire. Behold, Jehovah lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its service, and it scatters its inhabitants. I don't know how much more descriptive you can get than this. This planet will be scattered, devastated, distorted, and wasted. The prophet continues, Fear, the pit, and the snare are upon you, O inhabitants of the earth. It shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. The earth's future is in big trouble. The heaviness of transgression brought down the house. One day, the hand of Yahweh splits the earth apart, and there will be such a great earthquake unlike anything ever seen. Every mountain and island will move out of their place, and yes, there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. The prophets have been preaching judgment for thousands of years. Now, 
It's time to put away and eliminate the problem of evil. Behold, the day of Jehovah comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. This eye-opening description of a desolation makes you wonder that if the sinner is destroyed off of the earth, just where is this hell at? Where is this underworld where the barbecuing goes on without end? By the authority of Jehovah's word, the sinners will be destroyed out of the earth. Don't miss this. It can't get any clearer than this. You might want to take up a look at the definition of destroyed. This is a word of irreversible finalization. All broken down and all burned up. Another prophet saw this day and wrote down, I looked at the mountains and behold they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and no man was left. All the birds of the sky had fled. I looked and the fertile field was a desert. All its cities were torn down before Jehovah, before his fierce anger. Yes, the prophet Jeremiah looked and saw the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of Jehovah and by his fierce anger. Are you getting a clear picture now of what will happen to this planet? Polluted, desolate, violently broken, shaken beyond recognition, split open and burned up. No man was left. Yes, the earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. According to this, there's no mention of eternal torture here, but just a withering and a fading away of the rebellious. No hints of spider-like demons slicing and dicing away the eternally lost here, nor are there a billion of obnoxious screamers all hollering for Abraham's help to get a drop of water for their tongues. The prophet Jeremiah sees quite the contrary. He describes, I look at the earth and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking, and all the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. As we will discover, it is here, the desolate earth he had claimed as his home. Satan is now locked down and restrained. And this is where realization for him sets in. He's a real nowhere man, living in a nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. His first lie, finally unmasked, he said there was no death, and now he finds out that he was dead wrong. As he looks out across the death cape, his knee will bow, and what the book says, the originator of evil, now gets his day of reckoning. The book of Revelation reveals how. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Please notice, this angel is coming down from heaven to a desolated earth. Remember, coming down is always connected to an activity on the earth. Always. Now, follow this. He sees the dragon, that ancient servant, who is a devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the abyss and locked and set a seal over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were finished. Why can't he deceive the nations? Obviously, they are destroyed. Remember, the ones who destroyed the earth, they are destroyed. Dead folks, all of them. After the allotted thousand years, Satan's restraints will be taken off for a short time as the people of the nations are raised up in the wrong resurrection. During the time of this 1,000 years, the saints are apparently reviewing the judge's decisions. The prophet proclaims, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast in his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The Apostle Paul foretold of this day when the saints will even judge angels. Oh, what a day! When they come back to life on a resurrection day, they reigned along Yeshua, the undistracted, unobstructed by evil for one thousand years. Wow! The Revelation says they're going to be happy. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, a second death has no power. 
But they will be priests of God and of Yeshua and will reign with him for a thousand years. No fear of death any longer for the believer. Jehovah gives them a new name and death has no more power over them. They are immortal now. Now the rest of the dead, however, are waiting for the resurrection and reward. They will be raised up, judged, in a final time, a second time, they will die. This is called the second death. Friends, we've taken a look at the two particular types of judgments, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Now we're going to get a little bit more involved with this and look, look a little bit deeper into the finality of evil. Will evil continue to go on and on forever and ever? Or will there be an abrupt end evil and no trace of it throughout the universe? This is what God desires, is to take and eliminate evil, eradicate it, and get rid of it for good. Now, according to most popular theologians, hell is, a, is an issue where the minute they die, they go straight to hell, and they burn, they scream, you know. But I'm going to show you a little bit different view here as we dig deeper in this. So may God bless you again. Consider the fearful danger you are in. Tis a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. Is this what the scriptures really teach about hell? Let's break it down. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were complete. Note, they are not alive here and will not come back to life until the appointed time has been completed. There's no one negotiating with Father Abraham here, folks. Don't miss this. They are not down in Hades screaming and yelling for mercy here. They are dead. Here is the real truth about how this will come down. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Whatever you determine Hades to be here, call it hell, call it a grave, whatever you believe Hades to be, recognize this. There are dead folks there, and now they are coming back to life to see the judge. It's their day in court. Do not be amazed at this, for the time is coming which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Evil's day is reserved, and they're coming up, and they're coming out of the grave to be condemned, coming up from the ground, not going down into it. Jesus confirms two resurrections here. The wicked will arise from Hades for sentencing. Another prophet puts it this way. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. The dead who have been sleeping in the dust now wake up to find themselves standing before the judge on an eternal contempt charge, bringing with it the penalty of a second death. This is the everlasting punishment and the destruction which will last forever. For those who see the parable of the rich man and Lazarus as proof of going to hell at death might want to re-examine their position. As we have learned, the fiery torment comes after the judgment, after a resurrection from the dead, not immediately at death. So right away it is apparent that this cannot be a literal story. Add to the prophet Daniel's prophecy one day they will wake up to receive the reward. The Bible is clear at what really happens at death. Listen to some witnesses who know. Moses told us, after Adam disregarded Yahweh's command, God told Adam, till you return into the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and into dust shall you return. Adam didn't go to heaven, he didn't go to hell, 
he returned to the dust. Neither did Father Abraham. We learn from Peter's testimony, filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he declared that even King David did not ascend into the heavens. King David, who understood his lot, wrote this, You cause man to return unto dust. He reveals that, You gather in your spirit, they expire, and return to their dust. And then he sums up this power by declaring, Their spirit goes forth, he returns to his earth, and in that very day his thoughts perish. The narrative says, The rich man died and was buried. The beggar died too. But the angels carried him away into Abraham's bosom. This is the only place in the Bible where it says at death, man goes to Abraham's bosom. If this is a literal story, then does everyone who is a beggar go to Abraham's bosom at the moment of death? Is Abraham's bosom the reward of the saved? You know, this story does not tell us that Abraham's bosom is in heaven. By the way, how many redeemed saints can fit into Abraham's bosom anyway? Let's get another revelation about where the dead return to. King Solomon put it very plainly. He says, Surely the fate of human beings is like that of animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and to dust all return. According to this eye-opening revelation, all go to the same place, all come from dust, and all go back to dust. The return is not back to two places, heaven or hell, but one place, back to the ground. As is noted in the previous revelations about death, this is what the Bible clearly teaches. The fact of the matter is, no one goes to Abraham's bosom when they die. All are in Sheol, both good and bad. The Bible says, the dead do not know nothing. How can the rich man communicate if he doesn't know anything? Abraham is not the one with whom the rich man would try to bargain with anyway, because there's only one way, one mediator, Yeshua is his name. Abraham doesn't fit that bill. Not only this, but the Bible says that the dead do not go up at death, but go down into silence. They go back to the dust of the earth, and when the rich man died and went to Hades, as we've already discovered, Hades delivers up the dead which are in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. In this passage, it is compelling to note that whatever is in hell or Hades contains the dead in them. Remember, to deliver up the dead indicates a resurrection is taking place. Once the dead are delivered up, then they are cast into the lake of fire. If we ignore these Bible facts and hold to the traditional thinking and teaching of the fallacy of eternal torture, we hide ourselves from considering just how this demonic teaching perpetuates evil where Satan is still king over his own domain, sending out his four-foot spider demons to poke with a hot iron the eternally damned. More importantly, how does this portray the spotless Lamb of God who is tortured for us? He who asked his father to forgive the executors who had ripped the flesh off him with whips and drove spikes into his hands and feet, murdering him in front of his own family. We need to get our head in the right place with this. Now let's go back to the judgment scene. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The heavens and the earth fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is a book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. A frightening thought here, what the wicked have done are recorded in books and will give account, just like it says. And when the accused came without an advocate there in the courtroom to plead their case, and when her name was not found in the book of eternal life, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. The second death simply means the sinner dies once, then is raised from the grave to be judged, found to be guilty, and then thrown into the lake of fire to die their second, final time. This punishment is everlasting. No coming back from this one. Oh, what a tooth-gnashing day this will be. And here's how it all comes down. The wicked shall see it and be grieved, and he shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Yes, grieving, 
weeping and rabid, the wicked are burned up, they melt away and perish. There's no indicator of an eternal hell here. The wicked will not live forever. And how do I know this? Well, here's an eye-opening revelation. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now here is a huge point. Don't miss this. It is not possible for a sinner to have immortality and surely not a murderer. There will be no possibility of eternal life abiding in him. How can a sinner live forever in the flames of hell if eternal life is not possible for them? I know it would be tempting to hope that some folks deserve a life to live of torture trillions of years in the flesh in burning in the fervent heat of the Gagena barbecue pit. However, it is clear the cowardly and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars have their part which will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. John described this doom as a second death. According to this prophet, those evil people will die twice. James put it this way, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. As we discover the truth about evil coming to an end, let's ponder this description of hell from another perspective. And these people, they bite, they claw, they scratch. I've already told a story, but, but they do. This is part of what hell is like. They bite, they claw, they scratch, they chew, they're trying to get from the underneath who's on top of them. They're trying to get on top where people will stop biting and chewing and clawing on them. Because it's just people piled on top of people, piled on top of people, piled on top of people. It smells so bad that you think maggots should be crawling everywhere, but they ain't none. It's so dark, there's no light, but yet you can see. Now, people draw pictures of the fires of hell. You can't see the fires of hell because the fire is so hot that it's transparent. So you can't see the fires of hell. But you can sure feel the heat because it feels like that the skin is going to bubble up and the meat is going to melt and run off your bones. But when you look down at your hand and at your arm, and it looks just like it did when you were on earth. You can burn and have that experience, that pain, forever. Because if the flesh burned off of your bones, your pain would be over. But it can't be. Oh, no. It can't be. You've got to suffer forever. That is another torture. There are so many levels of torture in hell that it ain't even funny. There's the smell. There's the biting. There's the chewing. There's the clawing. There's the scratching. There's the fire. Because every single wall of hell is guarded by huge, like 35 to 40 foot demon plus, and every one of them's got a whip. And when they hit you with that whip to knock you off that wall, it is like being cut in half. The pain is so bad. These demons are so ugly. They are everything that you could possibly imagine and worse. They've got big teeth. They've got big claws. They're all leathered up and just nasty looking. And it's almost like they've got goat style feet but with big claws on them and goat style hands but with big claws on them and boy can they work that whip because I mean to tell you <clears throat> it don't take but one crack of that whip and you're off that wall and you're back in that torture. This depiction of hell is beyond the level of any sane person to be comprehend. Nowhere in the Bible will you find such nonsense. Now let's go back to how Jesus foretold the wicked would wind up. It was the same in the days of Lot People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And Jesus said, it will be just like this on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Apparently, just before Yeshua arrives, people will go about their business as usual. 
the righteous will come to their senses and leave wickedness behind, and immediately destruction will follow. Remember Lot's wife. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. This revealing statement provides a picture of fire and brimstone coming out of the sky and raining down on the wicked, totally wiping them out. This reminds me of a verse found in Psalms that collaborates this judgment scenario. Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone, and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. And the results of the fire are clear, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those after who should live ungodly. According, this is a preview. This story was written here for us to understand how the wicked folks will end. This tragic story will repeat itself on a worldwide scale next time. When the few got out of Sodom, in Sodom all they could see was the smoke of the country as it went up as the smoke of a furnace. This will happen again. After the fire has done its work, the Bible declares that the smoke of their torment will rise up forever as a reminder of sin's consequences. Yes, the smoke will be all that remains. Please listen. This Bible writer testifies, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of, listen, eternal fire. But please understand the phrase eternal fire. The punishment of the fire was eternal and irreversible. This phrase eternal fire does not mean that the fire is still destroying those two wicked cities. I watched a documentary clearly showing remnants of where they believe the biblical account was located. They found lots of brimstone embedded in the rocks and a whole bunch of ashes. Yes folks, the eternal fire will turn the wicked into ashes. Sounds like eternal punishment to me. And there's more. The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of Jehovah shall be as fat of lambs. They shall vanish. In the smoke, they shall vanish away. This is a vivid picture concerning evil's end here. Wickedness will perish like the smoke of Gomorrah. The sodomite man will vanish. As we listen carefully to the following word pictures from Bible writers, Let's ask ourselves, are there any indicators where the wicked will exist forever? Consider the phrases likening the wicked to wax that melts, like smoke blown away, broken pieces, slain, cut off, blotted out, the wicked vanish into smoke. Where is an eternal hell in all of this? Some more word pictures. The wicked just wither and fade away. They're like chaff that the wind blows away, broken pottery, rebuked and destroyed. They are likened as a green plant which will soon die away. And just what does that mean here? The wicked will be no more? No rich man will be hollering at Father Abraham for help here, friends. These are just a few among the many metaphors describing the end of the wicked. Cut off slain, perished, vanished, consumed, destroyed, second death, burned up. You know, right now I'm going to offer a thousand dollars to anyone who would show me out of these final answer words where eternal conscious torment forever and ever fits in any of these illustrations. In the Bible, all the prophets saw the ultimate end of the wicked and communicated their end through creative ways with word pictures. And here's another for our consideration, the prophet Hosea describes it this way. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears, like shaft swirling from a threshing floor, like smoke escaping through a window. You know, you can't get any clearer than this. Yes, one day the wicked shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them, and they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. According to this, after the fire has burned them up, no one will even find a hot coal around to warm up by. Hmm, yes, he will thoroughly purge his floor 
and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, no one but the Almighty himself, who has power over the flame, will be able to put out this flaming fire. Purged and burned up is their lot. Nothing more, nothing less. So let's close it up here. One day the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven and sits on the earth is called the Camp of the Saints. According to the final scenes of Revelation, at the end of a thousand years, the wicked are resurrected. And one prophet saw this and wrote, The realm of the dead below is a stir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who are leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones and all who were kings over the nations. Now being raised from the dead to meet their master, Satan, now, with restraints gone, has one more chance for him to deceive the resurrected and get them together to convince them that they can overtake those encamped in the New Jerusalem. And at some point, the resurrected wicked came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now, I want you to pay close attention to two phrases. Number one, the fire came down from heaven. Note that it did not come from way down in the center of the earth. But look, the wicked are not underneath the ground here, but they are running around on top of it. Phrase two, the fire devoured them. Have you ever looked up the word devoured? Have you ever seen anything still living after it was devoured? Neither has anyone else. Now they turn to the originator of evil and proclaim how the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. Jehovah God has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of rulers. Yes, don't miss this. The toothless broken oppressor will come to an end. Yes, one day everyone will just see just what kind of deceiver Satan really was. The wicked had put their confidence in this wicked angel will finally understand and respond by sarcasm. You also have become weak as we are. You have become one like us. And with enormous unbelief, who will see him will stare and they will ponder his faith and ask, is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble, who opened not the house of his prisoners? Yes, he led the multitudes down the broad path, falling through with his initial lie. You will not surely die, as they now face their second death, sealing their destruction, which will last forever. Satan's head is foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Here's the indictment, the judgment, and final say-so on what happens to the once magnificent angel. He who has ears to hear, hear this very carefully. This nails it. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your way from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Your heart became proud on your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings and I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you were appalled at you, you have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Friends, it is clear here, this wicked angel, a liar and murderer from the beginning, who started this whole disaster in the first place, will come to a horrible end and will be no more. According to this revelation, Satan will be consumed and brought to ashes to all who were watching. Yes, the fire will do its everlasting work. No more evil, no more evil doer. In light of this, how then should we respond? Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Fear Jehovah and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is coming. The one who can destroy us has also appealed to us through his loving son to turn towards him 
and escape the coming annihilation and everlasting destruction which will be brought on this earth to naught. Time is getting short. Jump on the board into the ark of safety. And the next time, this world will be destroyed by fire. Yeshua has the keys to the grave and death, and he has your key. Seize on it by believing his words today. Turn from your evil ways and change your direction, or he will destroy both you and your body and your soul. No, the wicked soul does not live on. It is destroyed with the body. But in the midst of judgment and bad news ahead, we have been promised a new place and eternal life. Peter sums it up. Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Make no mistake, this world will be destroyed. But Yeshua is going to make all things new and all of the pain, disease, heartbreaks, and deaths in this life will be remembered no more. It's your choice. This coming kingdom will be ruled by the owner of it. If he doesn't rule in your life now, he will not force you into the kingdom then. This offer is in front of you. Choose Jesus. And when you do, eyes have not seen, nor have your ears heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Friends, I've hit you with some pretty heavy stuff here, but I wanna let you know on the backside of all this is really good news. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should turn the direction around and go his way. Our way doesn't work all that well. So I'm imploring you today, if you haven't made that decision, please do so. Uh, you'll find that the best step that you've ever made in your life. I did that 30 years ago, and I'm glad of every day that I've been in, in the shadow of the Almighty. Because there is a big storm coming, and I'll make sure that I'm taken care of. And He takes care of me very, very well. But <clears throat> I want to be plain with you. One day you're going to die. Uh, don't believe it. Just go around any graveyard, look around. You're not going to escape it. And you know... The Bible says not only that, you're going to be judged for everything. The wise man Solomon said this, Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for he will bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The Bible also says that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, that's a gift of God. It's not something you can work up. You know, if I give you a pen, I say, here it is. What's it going to cost you? All you have to do is reach out and grab that. And that's what God did through his son, Jesus. It's a gift to humanity. And when you stand in the day of judgment, God help you if you don't have an advocate. But you have an advocate who lived this earth, showed what love is all about, demonstrated totally by giving his life for you and me. And now is an advocate for us and sits ever making intercession for us uh, as we live on our, earth, on our earthly experience right now. So you have him on your side. If you go into the courtroom without an advocate, you're in big trouble. The judge shows no favor. But the advocate we have is also the judge, friends. His name is Jesus. Because one day, if you have the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son of God, you have no life at all. So may God bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, grant you peace, in Jesus' name. Amen. It was, um, it wasn't like spoken to me. It wasn't anything audible. It was just something that my mind automatically knew. So I knew that I was hell and I knew that the feeling that I was feeling was eternal. So I knew that I was in eternity and it was just a feeling that I knew that the condition that I felt would never change. Okay. Like never, ever, 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 ever. And that was the really scary part about it because you knew that that horrible feeling that you were feeling would never go away. There was no rest. There was no cure. It was just, you were going to feel like that forever and ever and ever. You wouldn't even be able to die. You would just keep feeling that.